We've got to be trained and ready to fight before the battle. Just kind of ready to go at a moment's notice, right? Like spiritual minutemen. And that's what Abram had. You know, in, a, in Ephesians chapter 6, a verse I know you're probably familiar with. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And so we're to put on the armor of God, you know, our spiritual protection, our spiritual armor. And and we're to be ready. We're to be ready for battle. We should be spiritually armed and ready for battle. And how how do we do that exactly? Well, we should be trained in the word of God. You, you You should be able to handle the word of God. You know, the sword of the spirit. You should be able to handle the word of God. On your own. We should be trained and ready in in prayer. We should be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Especially in the days that we live in. I mean I I would say probably. uh, For for all of us. With the things that are going on in the world. Over the last five or six months. Or whatever it's been. uh, you, You quickly realized whether you were trained for battle or not. Right. Once they once they shut churches down. And you're kind of on your own spiritually. You knew, I knew, you knew just how trained up and ready we were for that. And I would say in the days that we live in, we, we want to be trained, we want to be ready. Uh, you know, if, since we believe the Bible and we believe what Jesus said about the last days, we really should expect things to get worse over time, not better. We, we will have, you know, temporary reprieves, certainly, But the general trend should be worse. Right? Jesus said it's going to be like birth pains. It's going to be like labor pains. And and, and labor pains come more frequently and with greater intensity the closer you get to the time of delivery. Right? And so we 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 should expect a greater frequency. We should expect a greater intensity. We're going through a pretty big labor pain right now in the world. And this is what what doctors would call a transition contraction, right? But at the same time, we shouldn't be surprised by that because Jesus said these things would happen in the world. So we want to be ready for that. We want to be ready. We want to be trained up uh, for, for all of that. Abram had 318 servants trained and ready for battle long before there was ever a battle, long before he knew what the battle would be. But Abram knew at some point there's going to be a battle to fight. And so I want to be prepared for it. Some point there's going to be a battle for you to fight and for me to fight. And so we want to be prepared for it. That's just wise to do. And so we're told Abram took his 318 trained men. He pursued the four armies under Chedorlaomer and he pursued them all the way up to Dan, way in the northern part of Israel. By the way, archaeologists have uncovered a gate at the city of Dan that dates back to the time of Abraham. It's called Abraham's Gate. Again, if you go with us, uh, you'll, you'll get to see that. And then verse 15. Let me get back to the passage. Verse 15. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. You know, Abram has these 318 men, they're kind of like special forces. He's got Chedorlaomer and his armies on the run. Chedorlaomer's army is retreating back toward their homeland. They're on the run. Abram caught up with them north of Damascus. He's, Abram's army travels some 225 miles, going up to Dan and then over toward Damascus. And it's there that Abram defeated these armies. These armies that rolled right over giants. 
These armies that conquered every kingdom they came to. Four armies. Four armies. And Abram with his 318 men are able to defeat Chedorlaomer and his four armies. It's a miraculous victory for Abram. Much like, much like Gideon in the book of Judges where he has his 300 men and he's able to defeat the Midianite army. Abram defeated four armies with 318 men. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is, this is God making the name of Abram great in the world. And so verse 16, he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. Now, as we finish up here, and I promise we're almost finished. The question we want to answer is, why does Abram risk his life and the lives of his servants to go up against such a powerful army? Abram could have stayed out of this. Abram uh, could have said, this is none of my business. Abram could have said, I'm, I'm, I'm not involved in this. This doesn't concern me. Abram could have said, when he received news about his nephew Lot, he could have said, you know what? Lot chose to live in Sodom. And now he's got to live with the consequences of his choice. And Lot got himself into this situation. He's got to get himself out of this situation. So why does he do this? And, 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 and here's the thing, and this is important. This is the whole, the whole point. Abram gets involved and he risks his own life and the life of his, life of his servants. And, and it's not because he's just a nice guy. And it's not because, certainly not because, Lot deserved to be rescued. <laughs> you know, Lot, Lot hasn't done anything to deserve to be rescued. You know, he, he chose to live in Sodom. It's his, own, it's his own fault. Abram rescued Lot, and this is an important point that we're going to spend a couple minutes on before we finish. He, he rescued Lot because Abram was the patriarch of the family. And you're thinking, really? That's, that's it? That's the point? Abram was the patriarch of the family. This is a, this is a, a, a patriarchal uh, society, and Abram was, was the patriarch. That's why the one who escaped went and told Abram. Because Abram's the patriarch. He's the, he's the head of the family, if you will. Now, we don't, we don't really have a patriarchal society like they did in ancient times in ancient Israel. So we, we don't fully understand the meaning of the fact that Abram was the patriarch of the family. And let me just tell you, in those days, at that time, the patriarch of a family had a responsibility and had an obligation to rescue a family member that was in trouble. Whether that was financial trouble, or in this case, taken captive by an enemy. The patriarch of the family had a responsibility and an obligation to rescue a family member that was taken captive, even if, listen, even if that family member was seized by an enemy and taken into slavery because of their own bad choices and their faithless life, even if they got themselves into that situation, the patriarch still had an obligation as the patriarch. He was still expected to rescue that family member. And the patriarch would then deal with that family member's bad decisions privately after rescuing him or her. But but as the patriarch, there was an expectation, there was an obligation, there was a responsibility to rescue a family member who was seized by an enemy and taken captive and enslaved. No matter what the circumstances were that got that person in that situation, and if that patriarch didn't do it, it looked badly on the patriarch. 